sack of money is done. Do you all have a drink to hand? John, yes. Yeah, so yeah, so yeah, so yeah, yeah, and the shepherd's pie in your mouth. And the yoghurt. You go for it. You go Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, welcome to this amazing event with lots of people from the past uh, for this wonderful and very extraordinary book launching. Um, I am Stuart Diana Matkin and uh, I knew Alan quite well. And um, I was reading uh, the introduction that Tim wrote in the book, which you may have, some of you may have seen. And I would like to make a few comments about in the introduction a little bit later, but um, <laughs> compliment. Yes, compliment. Uh, okay, not compliment. But, uh, it mentioned the uh, readings that Alan and Tim did for many years, and uh, Tim kindly mentioned my name in the introduction and uh, at Albion's, and that is what uh, my photos here are all about. Um, they were in Kojimachi and in uh, Ebisu. And uh, I think really I should begin by thinking about Alan's voice. Because Alan's voice was very distinctive and very clipped, if you remember. <laughs> and uh, it was the voice that launched a million tea bags. <laughs> because he did TV commercials for Sir Thomas Lipton. <laughs> <laughs> Which some of you may remember. So if I could just approximate uh, Alan, sorry about this Alan, but uh, anyway, um, with a little bit of uh, Shakespeare paraphrase as the introduction. Friends of Alan, Japanese citizens, <laughs> countrymen, and others, I come to celebrate the wonderful writings of Alan Booth. Not to praise <laughs> Timothy Harris. <laughs> and why I say that is because Tim and I had a meeting here to discuss this evening on this wooden um, kind of L a few days ago, and uh, Tim specifically said, please don't praise me. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, every, tonight, please, nobody praise Tim. <laughs> However, you can praise Alan as much as you like. Um, but having said that, uh, I just want to say that this is an extraordinary thing he's done. Because where else in the world would you get somebody who, for 25 years, um, actually puts in tremendous effort to produce a book of the writings of their friend, which could possibly disappear? He wanted to keep them for posterity because they were so good, and it's been a tremendous effort, and he succeeded. And I think we have to praise him for that, don't you think? Maybe the first toast of the evening, but anyway, <laughs> let's have a toast and then I'll get on to some other stuff. So let's say uh, to Timothy Harris. What's going to say, Minister? Okay, that's the end of the praising round. Right? Um, just, to, just to tell you what's happening tonight, uh, roughly, we we decided that we would have. Um, there are several people who would like to give a little little talk, and um, so we will have two or three at a time. Then we'll have a nice break uh, because Alan would want you to drink and, uh, and eat. So we'll take it very uh, leisurely. Um, it's 25 years. And um, I was uh, this 
um, came to me very strongly uh, just two weeks ago when um, our old friend Doreen Simmons, who many of you knew, died. And uh, she was a kind of sumo commentator and multi-talented woman. She was actually 85. She would have been 86 next week. Um, and uh, I thought, well, 85. And I thought about it, and I realized the last time I saw Alan with a glass of beer in his hand was at her 60th birthday party in the 1066 restaurant in Nakamega, or somebody you remember, uh, in 1992. And um, I thought, wow, it's already 25 years. Of course, going back, when did I first meet Alan? Well, Tim said he met him in The Rising Sun, which is probably where, where I met him as well, and probably met you through him. Uh, but um, I actually had various near misses with Alan, because I discovered, as Tim mentions, um, Alan was at the University of Birmingham studying English and doing lots of dr dramatic things. And uh, one critic said that Alan could possibly be the next Laurence Olivier, which is very interesting, very complimentary. Uh, but he, of course, decided to become a writer, not an actor. Um, however, I was at the school exactly in front of the University of Birmingham, across the road. And uh, he was, a, of course, would be my, somewhat my senpai. But when I was a senior boy at the school, he was at the university, presumably. And I thought, well, we could have met. Because I was in the rugby club, and after a match, we would always go down the road to the pub, which the university students went to as well. Maybe we met sometime. <laughs> And he performed in the Cannon Hill Park in Birmingham, a famous arts centre, which and I used to go. Don't remember seeing him, but Alan told us he once did Caliban there. I think he was painted green, wasn't he? <laughs> and totally naked. This was the 1960s. Yeah. And fortunately, I missed this performance. <laughs> but uh, Alan said there were somewhat embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> Some embarrassing stories about this. We, we, won't, story? we won't. No, we won't go into. <laughs> anyway, I missed him there. And then when I came um, to live in Tokyo in 1976, um, I came to work at the ILC Language School, and we had various former teachers and staff here tonight. And uh, Alan had just finished working there, so I missed him again. <laughs> um, but somehow or other, probably at the Rising Sun. I met him, and he one day he rounded up a lot of first teachers to do a recording. I have no idea what it was, maybe for Toyota, I can't remember. Just as kind of extra voices. And um, I went to the studio, and there was the great Alan Booth. He was in with the director and the producers, speaking Japanese, <laughs> kind of directing me through. <laughs> I was so impressed. What a wonderful person. And he actually kind of launched my um, recording career in Japan, which I'm very grateful. Thank you. Um, but he was already very busy. He was already producing books. I have here one of his first university textbooks. He liked books with alliterative titles. Look at this one. Moods, Myths and Madness. <laughs> his 31 Thoughts on Japan, illustrated by Alan Booth. <laughs> also an illustrator. And uh, he also had another one. This was before I met him. Being British. <laughs> These are amazingly sarcastic books. <laughs> he was trying to change the whole education system in Japan in his, in his 20s after three years living here. And uh, they, make, they make wonderful reading. And I think this is probably the first time in the history of university textbooks that the annotator, who was a professor, actually felt he had to write an introduction in which he said, this is so, this young British writer is so destructive. Everything he says is totally wrong. <laughs> is that a wonderful introduction to somebody? <laughs> anyway, he was already, uh, his writing had uh, begun. Um, uh, then, of course, um, um, 
in the narration world, uh, we did actually uh, do a lot of recordings together, and uh, I recorded, I went through all these performances. I had a delightful time sitting, watching them perform, recording them, taking photographs uh, of many Shakespeare and other um, poets. And uh, it was a very interesting experience. But what was so funny about these two is that Tim was the poet and the uh, critic, poetry critic, who had, has an, and still has an amazing photographic memory. He's the only person I know who can, can remember hundreds of lines of Paradise Lost. And here was Alan Bidders, the actor who could have been Lawrence Olivier in the next Lawrence Olivier. And Alan Booth would always be on the podium like this. You know, to be, or not to be. <laughs> and Tim, of course, was totally different. He was, oh, la, la. <laughs> anyway, a very interesting uh, time we have with that. Um, one, one other thing that Tim mentions in the um, introduction is uh, Ura uh, Tim, of course, went on this amazing journey all the way from north to south and. What did you not say? To me, they're the same person. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, let's start again. Alan did these amazing journeys, and of course he loved the north of Japan. And when he, he really had a hard time because at NHK, when he did interviews, they would not allow him to say Uranihon. And he got so angry, I remember. He kept telling them, look, I've spent all this time in Uranihon. The people who live in Uranihon say it's Uranihon. They use it themselves. Why shouldn't NHK use it? But as far as I know, he never succeeded in <laughs> And the other thing that used to really uh, piss him off was um, uh, 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 American spelling. <laughs> <laughs> He's not alone in this. <laughs> uh, he fought that battle many times for newspapers and for books. And he didn't succeed very much, I think. Most of us don't succeed. But he really believed that <laughs> British spelling is part of the whole agi of the writer. And suddenly to have American Webster spelling kind of destroys the whole mood. But anyway, that was one thing he didn't succeed. Um, so that's really about all I'd like to say based on the introduction. Um, and uh, other people can move on soon. I would just like to finish with one quotation which is actually from one of these books. Uh, and it is this. He said, it is not the truth that angers me so much as the lie. Which I think is a great lie. So thank you very much. Indeed. Hey. It's a great pleasure that we have with us today, uh, all the way from Singapore, we have Alan's wife, Sue Cheng, and we also have all the way from America, uh, his daughter Mirai, and they're both going to say something to us, and later on Mirai will give us a little reading, so could I just um, hand over to Sue Cheng. Thank you, Stuart, especially for reminding me so much of, of Alan. You did a great, great job. Awesome. 25 years, and it's like he, he was standing up here. <laughs> Very touched. Um, I, I have nothing to say after, after Stuart, sir, <laughs> except to thank him and to thank Tim, especially, for his years of devotion to Alan and to bring this, this book about. Totally 100% Tim. Tim's hard, hard work. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything. He shed sweat, tears, 
and I don't know what else, right? And Yoshiko would know, and I also want to thank Yoshiko for her patience and endurance. <laughs> 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 I know because I had to put up with Alan, right? <laughs> so, and, and to thank Rai for uh, agreeing to publish the book. Uh, and it's also taken you a lot of uh, resilience and, and patience um, to do this. So, thank you all, and thank you all very much for coming, the old friends and new friends. And um, I, I've left Japan 20 three years ago, two years after Alan passed away. I moved to Singapore and I'm still there working. And uh, and my daughter, she was seven when Alan died and uh, she now lives in LA. So she's come back today for, for this event and I flew in from, just arrived from LA and I flew in from Singapore. And I, I'm so glad that we came just to hear, to see all of you and hear, to hear Stuart doing Alan. <laughs> that was just worth it. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, Tim. I mean, really, really, don't worry, Gato. Tim wasn't so sure whether he wanted to do or not, but I think he will. And that is just say three words to us, or four words. Is that right? Hey. 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 I have a hate on the microphone. <laughs> so can you all hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, Speak up. <laughs> um, well, um, after Alan died, I wanted to produce this book. First of all, though, there was Looking for the Lost, which was published after Alan died, and essentially I edited that. And then I was trying to get a publisher to do this kind of book. Kodansha were very miserable now. Um, I wrote to various places, um, the Stonebridge Press in in California. Oh, they were very delighted to hear about this, and um, uh, you know, uh, so I sent them the plan for it. Then I heard nothing and nothing and nothing and nothing. And eventually, I wrote a few times, still nothing. Finally, I wrote. It. I wrote and said, you know, if you don't want to publish this book, then I don't mind. But please have the courtesy to get in touch. But they never did. <laughs> um, anyway, so finally, I found Rye. And the reason why I found Rye is because he publishes some rather interesting magazines about craft beer, <laughs> hey, oh, both in Japanese and in English, and also on sake, you both in Japanese and in English. And I think a uh, magazine on Yokohama? Yep, yep. And he's also published a few um, guidebooks. And he published um, one of Alan's articles in the beer magazine. And so eventually we agreed that Rai would do this. And so I'm very, very thankful because we finally got a really, really splendid looking book. Um, and the reason for uh, 25 years, um, but the reason for publishing this book is it, it's not just because Alan was my friend, um, it's because it contains some of Alan's very, very best writing. And I felt that these were, uh, this was writing that deserved to be out there where people could read it, as opposed to being sort of lost in yellowing newspaper files and so on and so forth. Um, it was a difficult problem. I was very naive. I assumed that with uh, a modern equipment, it would be very easy to sort of scan old newspapers and, <laughs> and uh, you would get a text more or less immediately. And then I discovered it wasn't like that at all. And so, so Cheng very kindly found this very nice Indian man, I think, in, in Singapore. It was terribly helpful. He scanned these things, but then they were sent to me. And of course, some of the scans don't come out so well. So and then you have to sort of put the columns in place and then sort of make it a proper text. So it took months simply doing that kind of thing. Um, anyway, well, we, 
we've got it done. And um, also the, the photograph on the front was done by one of Roy's uh, colleagues, uh, Brian, what's his name? Brian Kowalski. Yeah, yeah. Which he, he went up to Al Molly and, and uh, took this wonderful photograph of the Nipta. Um Do you want to hear the story of Adam as Caliban? Yes! <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, um, Well, anyway, the story of Alan as Caliban, the director was the Professor John Russell Brown, oh, yeah. who has written lots and lots of very academic books about Shakespeare. Yes. And he apparently spoke rather like this. And um, Alan was supposed to, having been painted green and being naked, he was supposed to come on stage plus an erection. <laughs> in his first appearance. <laughs> um, well, Alan really found it rather difficult <laughs> um, and didn't manage it. And Russell Brown was really rather got very angry. That's awesome. What's the matter, Wolf? Can't get it up! <laughs> anyway, finally Alan did manage it. And he came onto the stage with a splendid erection, and Miranda was so shocked that she forgot her lines. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story. And I think I've probably said enough, okay? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you all very much for coming, and um, I hope that you will enjoy the book, because I think it's a very good one. Incidentally, tomorrow in the Japan Times, I think, or either tomorrow or Sunday, there will be a highly favorable review. <laughs> Not written by me. <laughs> what about the Asahi? It's by Damien Flanagan, who is um, he's a he's a good chap. He, he he's written a very good book on Mishima, and he came and gave a, a lecture at the, at the press club recently. Um, so he's a good man, a very bright man. He and he he wrote and said that he, he thinks it's an absolutely fantastic book, and he hopes he'll be able to do it justice. So something coming out tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, let's have a little ten minutes break for refilling our glasses. Yes, we need everything. So. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, could we move on to part two? Um, two of uh, Alan's old uh, Japanese friends are going to talk to us in a moment, but first of all, a few words from Rai, the publisher. Yeah, right. I'm like, I'm like Tim, I prefer not using the mic. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to all of those who bought the book. As some of you may know, the book took a little bit longer to come out than we expected, and half of that is Tim's fault, and half of it is mine. Um, this is what it was like uh, looking at that. It's all Tim wants to come up. <laughs> it wasn't quite like that. I won't watch it. But having it was Tim's fault because I'm somebody who, as you know, um, drinks as I work. Uh, that's part of my job, publishing alcohol magazines, and it seemed appropriate. You know, alcohol and, and working seem to go hand in hand, especially when you're doing a, a book like uh, Alan's. And, um, the amount of edits that I got from Tim were extraordinary, but I meant that, and, and, and I mean that in a good way, but it was very, very, um, the Japanese word is komakai, very 
detailed, excruciatingly detailed, so it took a long time. And this was, you know, definitely one of the, the most heavily, heavily edited books that we've ever done. Um, <laughs> It, it took a, it took a long time, you know. Again, because uh, we wanted to do it right, and it was very funny. Uh, Tim Tim said, you know, it, it doesn't matter how long it takes. We just want to do it correctly, and that was like the worst excuse to give somebody who drinks and works at the same time. <laughs> um, but luckily, uh, we managed to get it. And, and as the project went along, uh, it. it the pressure started to dawn on me. This was a, this is an incredible work we're doing, and, and you know, as you as all of you read this, you'll you'll see it's an extraordinary piece of work. Um, I was very honored to be able to to do this. Um, I came to Japan in '94, '95 for just one year of college, and then I came back in '97, and I was dispatched to an international center in Fukuoka, which incidentally had a library. And part of my job was stocking the library. Uh, mostly with just stuff I wanted to read. Um, but one of those books was uh, Alan's um, Looking for the Lost. And it was just an extraordinary book to read. Uh, and it kind of changed my future in a way. Um, that job, incidentally, is what launched me on uh, the, the career path of publishing. I really just enjoyed books and wanted to, to publish books about Japan. And I wanted to publish books like Alan was writing, people who you know, were really going deep and, and telling the real story of Japan. Um, Alan's books, I think, are underappreciated. I, I did go on, actually, um, after those five years in Fukuoka, I went on to graduate school. Um, I got my my you know my degree in, in literature, and I was involved in academia for a while. And I, I just think Alan's books are extremely underappreciated. Um, academic writing is concerned with itself, not the subject matter that it talks about so often. And journalism, it, it's it's strange to me. I know a lot of you are journalists, but in, in journalism, you, you, it's almost like you try to erase yourself from the writing. And to me, that's very difficult. And Alan was so great at actually immersing himself in the subject material. And, and that's what was so brilliant about it, and, and that he cuts to the truth more so than a lot of journalism and more so than a lot of academic writing. It's almost like this own you know, genre. And maybe that's why travel writing is so compelling. But this is more than travel writing. It's, it's really somebody who captured the essence of Japan at that time that he wrote. As I said, you know, I, I didn't discover him till till the '90s. A lot of you relate to his books in different ways because you knew him and you knew what he was writing about, and a lot of you experienced those times and and could relate to it in different ways. But for somebody like me coming to it afterward, this was somebody articulating Japan. You know, I, I when I came in the '90s on the Jet program, there were lots of expatriates coming into Japan and trying to get a grasp of Japan, and Alan was one of the people that kind of explain the real Japan in a way. And now it's great, 20 years later, to be publishing this work for the people that are coming after me. And what the great pleasure of reading this book was that it's a reminder of what Japan actually was like in those times, in the 80s and 90s. And there's not a lot of good documentary writing about what culture was like at those times. And he really pierces you know, the just a, a lot of the untruths that you get in a lot of other writing. You know, his his film reviews are brilliant. You know, you can really get a, a feel for the way uh, entertainment was at the time and how people enjoyed movies and the and the writing about festivals. It's just amazing. So, again, thank you, you know, Tim for for reaching out to me and. It just seemed like a perfect fit uh, to be able to do this book about a guy who drinks beer and walks across Japan. I mean, I felt <laughs> yes, this is what I live for. You know, it's so exciting. And I was so excited when uh, our publisher, or excuse me, uh, our printer, Mochi, is here tonight. He's the man over there who did a fantastic job. extraordinary job yeah. with the printing and it, it was so easy to impress upon him the importance of doing a, you know a high quality job on the printing and, and lo and behold he said when I was in middle school I read Alan Booth so he also read the Japanese translation of you know the Rosa Sasata so this was just it, it seemed like fate that you know that Tim and I would connect and then it happens that our printer knew Alan as well so it, it just seems like um, 
it was a great fit all around. And again, I want to thank Tim for the opportunity. And I hope you guys will enjoy the book, spread the word. As Tim said, um, the Japan Times is going to be publishing a review, and there will be other newspapers and, and magazines doing reviews. Um, there is a website that, that we run, um, and we'll have more information uh, for your friends where to buy the books, how to buy the books outside of the internet. So thank you all, and if you could just spread the word, not just for the publication and, and so I can make more money and drink more beer, but <laughs> just so that we can, you know, spread the word about Alan and his great writings and just keep alive this, this great documentary work about Japan at that time. Period. So thank you. Right. And uh, now it's time for um, someone who knew uh, Alan very well. This is uh, Michio Kondo san. Uh, Kondo san, if you could kindly give us a few words. Thank you very much. And I think uh, Alan and Kondo san shared uh, a few beers together. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> え、皆さん、こんばんは。今日はなんか素晴らしい公演本を手にして、本当に嬉しいですね。で、チームさんがこれをやっていたっていうことを編集してたってことはあの聞いておりましたから、で、苦労してたってことも。よくぞできましたね
晴れたあったことで私の人生はまあ手前味噌っぽいんですけどリッチになったなっていうそういう感じですごくしますね嬉しかったですねそういう思いがあって今日皆さん、まあ、あのお会いしたことがある方もおられるしまあ初めてお会いする方もおら,おられるわけなんですけれども本当に本当にこれたくさんの方のお集まりになって誰もちゃんとまあ名字に尽きるっていうんですかねそういう気持ちになっているんじゃないかと私は思います今日はどうもありがとうございましたはい。
and I chose Miss Toda Natsuko. You know, she's very well known now, but uh, for translation, uh, translate. But in those days, she was not so well known. And that's how the narrator, my friend, scriptwriter, strongly recommended Alan Booth. So I accepted. I started to work with him. In the studio, when we met for the first time in the studio, he came over to me and said, Mr. Yokota, I have something very important to tell you. Actually, I'm Irish and from the working class. But, <laughs> <laughs> hearing my accent, you may not be able to judge, but I'm from the working class. Please remember it. <laughs> and I actually don't know what he was talking about. <laughs> actually, Japan is a classless society. Japan got rid of it 150 years ago. We do not talk about it. We don't even think about it. <laughs> you know, I so later I studied a little bit about the class system in Britain and other parts of Europe. But still, I'm in the dark. I really do not understand why he told me that. <laughs> but in the studio, he bitterly complained about the translation done by Toda Natsuko. <laughs> oh, this was awful. This is awful, my God. And I told him, I told him, you are a well-known English writer, so you have the perfect right to change the script. But but I have my own budget. <laughs> we must finish the job within the day. You understand it? <laughs> and Alan really understood it. And he changed many parts of the script, but he didn't take so much time. And the uh, program was finished. And there was some important scene in the film. As I said, uh, uh, Mr. Onoda, uh, maybe I didn't say that, Mr. Onoda in the jungle had three colleagues, and they died one by one. And for the some, uh, last some years, he had to live all by himself. And in Japan, he visited all the three families and to explain why and how they died. It was a very uh, painful pilgrimage. And uh, in front of the families and the relatives, he actually, he couldn't talk much. The silence overwhelmed the whole scene. And whenever he said a word, a wave of emotion sp spread through the families and relatives. This is a very intense scene, and we call it, according to Kabuki term, uh, Kanjinjo scene. <laughs> and Alan really uh, dealt with this very delicate and intense scene in a very, very exquisite way, with subdued emotion and also with cozy accuracy. And his narration overall was very, very good. I made a second film later, but the first one was really, really good, much better than the second one, I would say. But anyway, this film uh, got a very prestigious uh, uh, ABU Prize. Awesome. ABU stands for Asian uh, Broadcasting Union, covering Asia, the Middle East, and Oceania. In 1976, their general meeting was held was held in Israel, and they chose my program for the special recommendation prize, yeah. and we are very happy about that. Well, in, uh, four years later, in 1980, I had another chance to work with him. Uh, it was, again, the uh, documentary film for 90 minutes time slot about a crippled baby monkey called Daigo. 
My friend cameraman, Mr. Otani, found a dying uh, baby monkey in Abajishima Island. He had no hands, no legs, and he was abandoned by his mother. And uh, Mr. Otani got special permit from the country and tried to raise him in his house as a uh, guinea pig. And uh, Otani's family had three daughters, and Daigoro became the first son. <laughs> And uh, anyway, this baby monkey showed a tremendous uh, mental ability, well, I would say mental agility. He understood Japanese perfectly, and he loved to watch television programs. <laughs> and he could even turn on the television using his mouth. <laughs> and anyway, uh, this program was a very, very special one. Very special because this program was broadcast by Fuji uh, on prime time show for the first time from 7.30 to 9. And this program was very special because it earned a tremendously high viewing rate. It was 28.8%. This was very, very amazing in those days because Fuji TV was suffering from low viewing rate in those days. Even the uh, prime time drama barely got 10%. And uh, this 28.8% still remains the highest viewing rate for Fuji television so many years. And uh, this program was rebroadcast a week later at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Again, it got 11.1%. So in all, it earned 39.9%, almost 40%. This means one third of the Japanese people watched it. And we just, uh, of course, Fuji TV wanted to make an international version, English version. And I asked Alan Booth again. Okay. And he was living only 20, uh, 200 meters away from my house. <laughs> he was living with his Japanese wife, uh, a very spacious Japanese style house. And one day I visited him to discuss the program. Then I was shocked to find that Alan Booth was a very, very Keishu Kampaku. <laughs> you understand? Keishu Kampaku. He was extremely bossy <laughs> to his wife and he constantly yelled and nagged and uh, ordering her what to do or what not to do. He dominated the whole house. <laughs> and while we are talking, a lovely cat came into the room. I invited him on my lap. He quickly settled down on my lap. Then he howled in Japanese. Hey, how did you? Why? Did, how did you let the cat come into a sneak into our room? We are talking about something very important. Take him away right now. But his wife didn't appear quickly. Then he grabbed the cat on my lap, and he resisted it. And his coat was stuck to my trousers. <laughs> but he, all his might, he grabbed the cat away. My God, my trousers got ripped off. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wearing a very fancy uh, trousers I, ha I had bought in Brazil. <laughs> And his face changed a little bit. <laughs> Don't say anything more. <laughs> so I thought, oh, British man doesn't apologize. <laughs> I thought. <laughs> anyway, uh, in the program, there was a very uh, interesting scene. One summer night, 
we try to observe the baby cat, a uh, baby monkey, whole night, how he behaves. And uh, because of the heat, he couldn't sleep very well. And finally, he went to a sleep at midnight, 12 o'clock midnight. At 2 o'clock, his mother, Junko, woke him up and brought him to the bathroom to make him pee. <laughs> you know, uh, zoologists say that uh, it, uh, the toilet training was impossible for wild monkeys. But actually, uh, Junko-san beautifully succeeded in making him urinate every two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and in front of the camera, I will beautifully. <laughs> And he went back to sleep. <laughs> then at four o'clock in the dawn, as the dawn breaks, he stands, Daigoro stands beside Mr. Otani, the master of the house, as if he were guarding his master while he was sleeping. He himself was very sleepy, but he fought against the sleepiness. He tried to continue to guard his master. It was a very touching scene. And uh, scriptwriter and I decided to uh, put some uh, quotation from the Bible. And uh, Toda Natsuko san quoted from the New Bible, uh, Modern Bible. And I asked Alan if he could change it to King James Version. <laughs> and he said, no problem. <laughs> And it goes very beautiful. Sorry. No, I can't see very well. <laughs> okay. Watchman, watch of the night. Watchman, watch of the night. The watchman said, the morning cometh, also the night. If you will inquire, inquire ye, return, come. Anyway, Alan rendition is, of course, much, much better. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, this program was not just about the baby monkey. It was about the pollution of Japan and the handicapped children and also nuclear uh, radiation because Junko, Otani's wife was a uh, Hiroshima victim. He barely, uh, uh, you know, uh, survived the atomic bomb, but he was she was suffering from the secondary radiation. So he was receiving the uh, medical check checkup regularly. So anyway, this uh, uh, English version. Uh, it's a title of Daigoro, Love Works a Miracle. Uh, you know, Japanese title was Tobe Itoshi no Daigoro, but the English title was uh, Daigoro, Love Works a Miracle. And this was uh, received uh, uh, very well internationally. It was sold to Europe, North America, and Asia too. And my boss, Mr. Goshe and I. Mr. Goshe is a very famous uh, filmmaker. Yeah. Perhaps you must have heard his name. Yeah. He He's died in the about book. He's in the book. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Okay. And Mr. Goshe and I uh, decided to uh, invite Mr. and Mrs. Alan to, uh, to dinner. And we met at a Russian restaurant in Shinjuku. And we had a very enjoyable night. And next day, Mr. Gosha told me, Alan Booth is quite a good-looking young man, but how could he marry such a woman? <laughs> She's thin and bony, with dark skin. Her nose sticks up like a crow. <laughs> he looks like a bird. He, yes, he's a bird woman. No, 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 I said. Gosha-san, you are completely wrong. I found her very attractive and adorable. I think she's very attractive and also very intelligent, smart. But Mr. Gosha wouldn't listen to me. Anyway, Mr. Gosha is a genius filmmaker, but 
very often he made such a stupid comment. <laughs> Concerning women. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was shocked to find that Alan Booth died in 1923 at the age of 47. So young. I regret I didn't contact him more often. I could have had many more interesting, interesting interactions if I did. I now know that I actually do not understand, or do not know anything about Alan Booth. And about 15 years ago, I met Mr. Tim Harris, Timothy Harris. And then, uh, quite by chance, and then we started to teach English drama to my alma, my alma mater, uh, Washington University's uh, English uh, ESS drama, uh, in, 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 uh, ESS students. And also I found that uh, Tim San was a close friend of Alan Booth. I was shocked to find this coincidence. The world is so small indeed, isn't it? Okay, this is the end of my story. Thank you very much for this. So let's now have another little break. Please fill your glasses, and after that, um, uh, Mirai san will be giving us a little reading. We just discovered that in fact it's Kondo san's birthday! So shall we give him a little sing along? I'm very on to you, but anyway, here we go. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kondo san. Happy birthday. Um, we're about to have Mirai on, but just before that, um, uh, Su Chen just uh, mentioned to me that um, uh, in Singapore she has what is really a rather important archive of Alan's um, works and all the things he collected over the years, lots of things about the history of Japan at that time and so on. And she's been wondering for a while what to do with these in the hope that they would be kept together and maybe put in some university or something. So she, she, she asked me to say, if anyone has any ideas about that, uh, could you please talk to her? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Not at all. And now I'd like to hand, hand you over to, to Mirai. Hello. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming and sharing your stories because, especially for me, as you know, his only blood relative. I didn't know him as well as any of you. Um, you know, uh, I knew the man who would play, um, you know, drums with chopsticks on the plates before dinner, and who would sing uh, Mary Poppins songs in the bathtub with me. Um, you know, I I didn't really know. The asshole you guys are describing. <laughs> now that I'm an adult, you know, I can hear all the erection stories from my dear Uncle Tim. <laughs> um, my other confession that I want to make to you all here is that 
Uh, I have never read his books. <laughs> Start now. I know. It's, um, you know, I think when I was younger, it was a bit scary to think, like, what would be revealed to me of this man that I don't know who is my father. Um, but this collection, I'm very excited to read, as I've had a little preview of it to choose a, a selection for you all. And um, yeah, I'm very excited to go back and read The Road to Sata eventually. <laughs> Maybe after this. Maybe I'll read this first. What do you think? Um, so, you know, I'm going to read this, and I didn't know his voice that well. I was only seven when he passed away, and um, my husband even, we found a BBC video of him, and he was like, oh, I didn't realize he would have an English accent. <laughs> what are you talking about? He's English. Um, I do not have an English accent, because... Uh, you know, other than Mary Poppins songs, my father mostly spoke to me in Japanese. <laughs> um, and other than that, it was, you know, Sesame Street and Disney movies. So imagine, imagine an English accent, if you will. <laughs> this is from the uh, collection of folk song writings. Spring Fancies, Mamonoga Ondo, Yamagata Prefecture. A gray spring. Two weeks ago, the cherry trees blossomed in Tokyo, but in the hills of Yamagata, the early blooming plum trees are still only in tiny bud. In the fields, the snow melts lumpily, leaving dirty, blackish islands of ice. The thaw swells the mountain streams, and they swirl past the flood gauges and warning boards in the silent villages. Many of the houses, and an occasional shrine, are still wrapped in the plaited straw that warms them through the winter, and the plants in the bone-hard gardens are invisible behind their tents of planks. Mounds of gray toad spawn quiver in the channels beside the empty, hilly roads, and everywhere the fields are loud with rushing water, splashing out of pipes, gurgling through drains, cutting through the ice with a shushing and droning, the sound of machinery waking up. In the little town of Mamonogawa, on a dull, winter-like afternoon, 18 women and two male tractor drivers hold a party to celebrate the first day of their work in the fields. Why I am invited to this party remains a mystery. I am out walking and suddenly find myself being hauled into the wooden shed where the party is taking place and ushered into this circle of laughing, red-faced women like the newly elected God of Spring. <laughs> so here I sit, clapping my hands, eating a herring, knocking back one of the mo knocking back one most of one large bottle of first grandchild that the tractor drivers have brought to share between them, listening to one of them whose name is Kumamoto practicing the two English phrases he can remember. I love you, and thank you very much. Their effect depending, presumably, on the order in which he says them. <laughs> and finally, begging the 18 red-faced women to sing for me the song of Mamorogawa. I am a plum blossom of Mamorogawa. You are a nightingale of Shinjo. You do not wait for my flower to bloom. You come while I'm still in bud. It is important to imagine this scene, these drinking, twinkly-eyed, dark-cheeked workers singing the love song of their little town as gaily and briskly as though it told the loss of a bicycle instead of the loss of virginity. <laughs> it is important because it was in precisely such circumstances that Mamurogawa Ondo was conceived. Sometime in the early 1930s, the Dekaseri, migrant workers, who went each year from Mamorogawa north to the fishing grounds of Hokkaido, learned a song called Natodushi and brought it back with them when they came home. 
Here, the women of Mamorogawa, particularly those who worked in bars or restaurants where the returned laborers would be most likely to vent their emotions in song, created new words and a shamisen accompaniment, transforming the Hokkaido fisherman's song into one that perfectly reflects the whims and desires of small town womanhood. Had it not been for the war, it is quite likely that Mamurogawa Ondo would have remained a strictly local property. But in 1936, an airfield was built in Mamurogawa for use in training air service cadets, a large number of whom were billeted in the town. In the same bars and restaurants where the women had learned the original song from the laborers, these cadets now learned the new version from the women. And when the war was over, they took it with them to all the various parts of the country from which they had come. By 1951, the last full year of the occupation, the song had grown so popular that it topped the nation's hit parade. Few folk songs can claim to have done that. And its popularity surely owed much to the fact that, though parts of it tell a tale of sadness and loss, it is at heart a song that celebrates life in a brash, energetic, humorous manner that must have been a powerful antidote to the darkness of post-war days. Round the back there's a wooden fence, round the front there's a dog. Shh, don't bark, it's not a thief, it's the daughter's fancy man. <laughs> Mamurogawa is the epitome of what the Japanese would call a nanimonai town, a boring town, a town with nothing whatever to recommend it, a town where on a rainy day the only thing to do is to sit for hours in a loud coffee shop reached by climbing a narrow set of iron steps where you listen to a succession of pop songs, I rub you, I rub you, I rub you, and to a space invader machine built into one of the coffee tables, which every few seconds emits a synthesized voice that says, UFO, and a burst of synthesized machine gun fire. The people at the town hall have done their best. They have set up a very large town map outside the little station that does much to reveal precisely what there isn't. <laughs> they have published a very lavish handbook of the town that is crammed with photographs and statistics. In a given year in Mamorogawa, population about 12,000, there are 182 births, 122 deaths, 104 marriages, 8 divorces, 406 movers in, 562 movers out, and each resident smokes 3,277 cigarettes. <laughs> But their greatest godsend has been the song. And so the town hall has printed a pamphlet about it, which contains not only most of the words, but a set of pin-like figures who demonstrate the accompanying dance. However, there has been a problem to consider. Parts of the song reflect a certain moral looseness, not often condoned by town halls. And after wrestling with this difficulty hard and long, the publishers of the pamphlet have found it necessary to make several discreet alterations. The fancy man, for example, has become, less problematically, someone to see the daughter. <laughs> and the following lovely verse has been omitted altogether. When I look in a mirror, I always reckon, though I can't say it's my parents' fault, that if I'd been born a bit better looking, I'd have had all the men I fancied. <laughs> <laughs> but the town hall's chief contribution to moral health has been the fabrication of an entirely new verse with which, in their pamphlet, the song ends. Mamorogal is a nice place. Shinjo's pride. The girls are pretty. The song renowned. Next time you're passing, stop a while and take our song home in your heart. <laughs> you can imagine, can't you? A gleeful mayor licking his lips, definitely not somebody else's, <laughs> over this. <laughs> Though it is harder to imagine the red-faced, twinkly-eyed working women whose song Mamorogawa Ondo really is caring a damn whether you stop a while or not, unless you climb fences or have a bone to quiet the dog. <laughs> In the evening, there is more to do. 
you can go a couple of miles up the road to a drive-in bar called Noah, aptly since it has rained nonstop for three days. <laughs> and there, if you are daring enough, or have had enough to drink, you can reach across the bar and tweet the breasts of one of the two girls in shiny red aprons. This will elicit, depending on who you are, a delighted shriek or a slap around the face. <laughs> and in either case, a tut tut from the master. If you sing there, it will be to the accompaniment of recorded tapes, none of which will contain Mamoru Gawa Ondo, although it was in the pre-war equivalents of just such a place that the song came into being, and it was to satisfy just such girls as these that the real, not the town hall's lyrics were sung. I dreamed a dream, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed of us and of our wedding. Our marriage cups were full and flowing. We raised them and I woke. When the plum trees finally bloom at the beginning of May, there will be dancing in the park, and in the evenings, when the lamps are lit, sake will be drunk to celebrate the late coming of spring to these chilly northern hills. It is not hard to sympathize with the bush warbler of Shinjo, whose patience ran out before the tardy plum flowers blossomed. There's been little snow this winter, say the people of Mamurogawa. Yet, in the town too, as well as in the fields, the last gray banks of it have yet to melt. They cling to the trees outside the coffee shop like dirty concrete socks. Mount Chokai, when it shows itself to the north in gaps between the dense gray clouds of rain, is still a blank and brilliant white. And to the south, on the shadowy slopes of Mount Gasan, there will be snow until August. The Dekanseki will be returning soon, not from Hokkaido, where the great herring shoals were fished out long ago and the industry can barely support the working men who live there, but from the south, from Shizuoka in Tokyo. The souvenirs they bring with them will be radios and cassette recorders, packaged songs, not real ones. But among the dark-skinned women who work in the fields, Mamurogawa Ondo will continue to be sung whenever there is an occasion to celebrate, whatever men pass in or out of their doors. Yay. I also want to say thank you to Uncle Tim, who, without fail, every year on my birthday he gave me a book, <laughs> many of which I did not read. <laughs> I did read Harry Potter. <laughs> no, I read a lot of them. But this, this book is uh, very special, and I don't think any gift will ever beat it. Thank you. In fact, your father didn't fall off while you were reading, which is a good, good something. Yeah. Even within America. <laughs> um, and it's so nice to hear you read that because, as Tim says in the introduction, you know, um, Alan was a great writer of the ordinary. And that was a wonderful example of how to describe the ordinary and actually make it sound incredibly attractive. You really want to go to the Noah Bar. <laughs> Um, and uh, next, we'd like to um, introduce Mafunisan from uh, Chigusa. Um, uh, earlier on, we mentioned uh, Chigusa as um, a place that um, Tim and Alan often went. And in fact, um, we commemorated the 10th and 20th anniversary of Alan's passing there. It was a very important place in Shinjuku. マフレシャンのベリベリクオーケーガンアクト。ああ、ただいま、ご紹介いただきました。あの、新宿の千草と居酒屋やってるんだ。え、ちょうど平時300人で、あ、グループオフレンズ、オールウェザーの何、ライク
、多分これは私のところ、審査官の、えー、私の発音が悪くて皆さんわからない場合はあ、あちらで本を買ってください、2500円です、有益な本です。えー私が初めてアランブースと会ったのはもうそう昨日のように思い,思い出します、えー、ある日トレンチコート非常によく似合う、うん、外国のお客さんが入ってきました黒い手袋をは,あのはめてき、えー、たので私はいつものように「いらっしゃいませ」あ「あお一人ですか?」って聞きました一<笑>人ですあいや、友達もあったんですよ、私のことは全然見ない、誰が話してるかわからないで、<笑>店の中、こんな広くないんです、店の中も目を漂わせて、えー、じゃあ、どうでしょう、何かお飲みになってお待ちになりますかって聞きました、いや、このまま待ってますよ、<笑>全く取りつく暇もなく、<笑>その、ノットフレンズになんです。<笑>さーって困ったっていうところに先ほどの近藤さんが来て助けてくれましたそれからというものは<笑>毎回のように打ち合わせのたびにあのチームさんを利用してくださいそしてやがてチームさんまたあのーえー、ここにも書いてありましたね<笑>、えー、いろいろの方がウォルフキャ,キャロメン・ウォルフそうです<笑>、えー、それからミラーさんメダさんえーえー、などそして、えー、納豆が好きな未来さんを納豆<笑>にして納豆ご飯を食べにちぐさになってくれました<笑>そうしたちぐさというものを皆さんから英国の人に知られたんで一番新宿で有名な店になってしまった<笑>、えー、そう私の思い出の中で一番誇りにすることはアランが日本文化を紹介するという番組で BBC のテレビジョンが撮影にちぐさに来ましたそれは今でもその YouTube で見ることができます、えー、アラン・ブルース BBC チクスやると検索するとすぐ出てきます、えー、Japanese Language and People Volume 20<笑>そこに出てくるアランブースは田舎道を重たい立候補しょって歩いてそしてホテルに入ってビールを早速注文しお刺身をおいしそうに食べてそれから温泉に入るわけです非常に人懐っこい顔<笑>私に見せたことないよ<笑>それでシーンが変わると東京の赤ちょうちんの居酒屋になりましたそこはチグサだったんですそれリハーサルなし台本もなし<笑>でアランが入ってきました「いらっしゃいませ」あ,あどう顔はさえ同じ人同じ場所なんでこんなに違うかフレンドリーな顔ですビールくださいあ,あそうですかどちらから来ましたロンドンですあ,あそうですか私は逆に今度は緊張しちゃってテレビの前だからガチガチなってロンドンフレンドリーそれでまあここはあのグッドヘブンっていうんで天国にグッドがあるのかバーテヘブンでもあるのか初めて知ったんです<笑>あ天国行って一番会いたいのはこのアランブースしかしアランブースはグッドヘブンには収まってないどっか他に行ってやるむしろバーテヘブンの方に行ってしまうんじゃないかと思うんですであるいは今田舎道を歩いてこっちへ向かってるのかもしれません、えー、そのようにアランにはとてもいい思い出を私にお試しくれました、えー、そしてこのようなあたなあ皆さんもとお知り合いになったことを大変に喜んでいますもう一度彼が遅れて田舎道を歩いて汗をかけながら入ってきたらもう一度いらっしゃいませと言ったようそんな感じをしております今日は皆さんどうもありがとうございました Thank you very much. Lovely story again. <laughs>、um, Minami san, would you like to? Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Um, this is really the end of our uh, arranged uh, uh, talks and readings. Um, so shall we just have a little um, little break, and then after that, uh, Tim said if anybody would like to say anything themselves, uh, they're very welcome. So uh, up to now, thank you very much indeed. And, uh,